Hi, welcome again on my research blog and my scientific blog, Discover Social Sciences. Uh, to those who don't know me, I introduce myself once again. Uh, my name is uh, Krzysztof Waśniewski. I am assistant professor uh, with the Faculty of Management at the Andrzej Frycz Modrzewski University in Kraków, Poland. And uh, this video is one more video in a whole series of videos which accompany updates on my scientific blog uh, uh, entitled Discover Social Sciences. So for those who are not familiar with the drill, uh, I, just, uh, I, I just want to precise that in the description box under the video you will find a link discoversocialsciences.com which by the way is spelled uh, below me in that window in that video window so you find that link you click on the link and the link takes you to the website of my blog to the website uh, discover social sciences and there you will find an a written update uh, with a lot of more information than what you can find in this video that written update will have the same title as this video okay so that's the that's the rule of coupling between my videos and my written updates uh, okay so i pass to the subject matter of uh, my update uh, i am opening something like a new thread of research it is not un it is not quite new uh, uh, I have been working on that a little bit and I have hinted the topic many times on my blog. Anyway, it is about cities and urbanization and the role of cities in our civilization. Uh, why am I doing it? Why am I interested in it? Uh, I think that the most immediate reason is uh, precisely the COVID-19 crisis and the economic consequences of lockdowns. What, what we can observe with that pandemic is that the places that are being hit the hardest are densely populated cities. Uh, and by all means, they are like the, the epicenters, the local epicenters of uh, uh, that epidemic outbreak. Uh, and in the same time, cities are the most adversely hit uh, by the lockdowns, by the social distancing. I remember that strange feeling, those strange thoughts that I had uh, when I was cycling through my hometown, uh, through Kraków, Poland, right after the formal introduction of the lockdowns. I think it was the 16th of March, something like that. The city was uh, like post-apocalyptically empty. People really took it seriously. Uh, I, I mean, I took social distances, uh, social distancing really seriously. And I had uh, that strange thought, that very strange question in my mind. How many human footsteps do we need for the city to work properly? Hmm? How much human movement do we need for the city to work economically and socio-economically as it is supposed to work? Okay, so here are my loose thoughts and now I come to something a little bit more scientific. So to my working hypothesis, which will make like the thread of my research. So here it comes. Technological change that has been going on in our civilization, at least since 1960, is oriented on increasing urbanization of humanity, and more specifically on effective rigid partition between urban areas and rural ones. Uh, first of all, one, uh, why 1960? For a very simple reason. Uh, when I try to find some statistics about cities, about macroeconomics, about the state of society, uh, usually those statistics start not earlier than in 1960. For example, if I use a, a very good source of information, which is the, uh, uh, the data website of the World Bank, it all starts in 1960. 
sometimes even later. But 1960 seems to be like the uh, like the moment of going out of the gate with a serious collection of uh, statistical quantitative data about societies, about countries, about economies. Uh, so why this hypothesis? L let me show you a few facts. Some of them are known or intuitively known, like a, a sort of a common knowledge. Some are, others are not quite as well known. So first of all, I open up gently with the coefficient of urbanization. The graph that you can see sort of behind me and uh, on my bottom on, on my bottom right uh, is the graph of uh, urban population represented as the percentage of total population of our planet. So in 1960, we were starting sort of modestly uh, around 33% of mankind living in cities. And in 2018, we were above 55%. So right now, more than half of humanity lives in urban structures. And now uh, there is like a um, commonly encountered narrative, both in in the media and in even in serious social sciences that due to that urbanization uh, cities are going to take more and more land to the detriment of agricultural land and to the detriment of wildlife so as we live more and more in cities cities will sort of invade on the grounds on the land that is needed for other purposes, for the purpose of feeding us or for the purpose of maintaining a healthy ecosystem, a healthy wild ecosystem around us. Well, it is not exactly the case. I did some research and as uh, strange as it could seem, uh, the total area of urban land on the planet seems to have been constant at least since 1990, so over the last 30 years. I know it sounds uh, completely counterintuitive. Whoever has traveled a little bit uh, through the world, uh, you could see those huge cities, especially in the developing countries and in the emerging markets. You could see those huge cities which sort of sprawl to the sides uh, which grow in an apparently uncontrolled way. Yes, we can observe that locally, but the data uh, published by the World Bank and apparently based on the data supplied by the Columbia University indicates that the total surface of urban land on the planet has been constant and has been a little bit more than 3,600,000 square kilometers. Uh, to support that, uh, I could say that whilst uh, some cities, some urban areas are growing widely, other tend to disappear. For example, if you take the former Soviet Union, if you uh, have a closer look at Siberia, hmm, you have many towns and cities which since the collapse of the Soviet Union have straightforwardly disappeared. You have urban settlements of millions of people who have just vanished due to, due to economic factors. Uh, so whilst there is some research which indicates that uh, the urban, uh, that the uncontrolled urban expansion is a real threat to humanity, it seems that in the recent history there is no evidence to, to, to support this claim. Cities seem to have a constant area, so at least a constant, uh, uh, a constant metric surface over decades. We don't know why. So we have that phenomenon, that social phenomenon, which I am trying to present on that compound uh, indexed graph. On that graph, I am reporting uh, the orange bars, uh, the orange uh, the orange vertical bars on the graph, 
re reproduce essentially the pre the previous graph I was showing. So they represent the uh, the coefficient of urbanization in the uh, uh, on the planet. And the blue, like the blue block, the blue continuous uh, enlarging block, is the density of urban population. So people per one square kilometer in urban areas, in cities across the planet. And in order to make those two variables comparable, I made them indexed on the values of the year 2000. By the way, for those of you uh, who want to learn a little bit about uh, techniques of quantitative analysis, this is a useful one. When you have two variables, two or more variables, uh, that you want to observe across time or over time and those variables are measured on very different scales of magnitude uh, you can use that trick in each time series so in the time series of each separate variable you take one year in the time series as one hmm, as denominator and you divide each other value in the time series by that constant denominator. It is called the formal name of this method is, I believe, uh, the constant base index or an index with a constant base. And here you can see that uh, essentially density of population in cities has been growing faster than the urbanization of humanity. We have two distinct processes which seem to be connected, but the question is how are they connected? So here comes the, it is partly a hypothesis, partly a, I'm sorry, ah yes, I need to put myself like above the slide. Uh, it is partly a hypothesis and partly a statement backed by science. It is my intuition that cities have a special function for us, for humans. They allow the formation of more social roles. And here comes, and here comes a bit of sociological theory or an anthropological theory, which I want to sort of unfold in that thread of research on cities and urbanization. We tend to assume that social roles are general categories. Uh, for example, uh, when a young person thinks about their professional life, they could say, I want, I want to be a neurosurgeon. I want to be an IT engineer. I want to be a scientist or something like that. Or I want to be a farmer. So that, I, uh, that a means that we intuitively account ourselves into a general category, into a social role, which is a general category. Still, as I have been working with the neural networks as a method to represent collective intelligence in human societies, I came to the conclusion that mathematically, if you like, if you really mean business mathematically, the distinction between a general category and an individual instance of that category is quite blurred, it is quite foggy. It all depends on the assumptions uh, that we make. So, for the purpose of that research on cities, I make an assumption, it is like halfway between an assumption and a hypothesis, that social roles that we play, that each of us plays in the society, are rather individual idiosyncratic instances or individual idiosyncratic phenomena uh, rather than general categories. Then, from, from then we can infer that if, if we consider social roles as individual idiosyncratic occurrences rather than as general categories, then the growing population requires a growing number of social roles. So each new human on the planet needs a new social role, which will be individual. In the same time, the more people uh, there are in the finite uh, habitable space of our planet, the more food we need and the more stringent we need to be on shielding agricultural land from other uses, so from uh, the urban encroaching on farmland. 
So this is like a spiral. Uh, our growing human population needs more agricultural resources and thus we need to be more and more particular about partitioning between agricultural land and urban space. And in the same time, we need more space in cities to develop more social roles for those additional human beings coming to the game. And from then on, I tried to find in literature, in history, if there are examples of at least theoretical takes similar, uh, similar to mine. And I found one. I found a, a similar take in a classic. Uh, here I am calling the classic. Uh, it is Arnold Toynbee. Uh, he, Arnold uh, Toynbee is, like, uh, is famous uh, by having written that huge book called uh, Study of History. Uh, the book in its original version had uh, 10 volumes, so it was like 10 books into one, uh, which was then abridged into one very thick volume by Mr. Somerville. And in that abridged version, in uh, section 3, the growths of civilizations, in chapter 10, the nature of growths of civilizations, I found the following quote that I, will take, that I will take the pleasure to read aloud and to comment on. By the way, uh, Toynbee, Arnold Toynbee, presents a very interesting point of view, which is uh, sort of useful today when we talk about pandemics, when we talk about climate change. The point of view that Arnold Toynbee presented was that human civilizations have a finite life cycle. He would claim that each human civilization known in history had a life cycle around uh, 2,500, 2,700 years. Huh? And that's it. Huh? Uh, after that life cycle is over, there is another human civilization like taking over the old one. So, the quote I found in that book. It was decided that Hellas should be a world of cities and not of villages of agriculture and not of pasturage, in, uh, and, uh, of order and not of anarchy. Yet the very success of their response to this first challenge exposed the victors to a second. For the victory which ensured the peaceful pursuit of agriculture in the lowlands gave a momentum to the growth of population, and this momentum did not come to a standstill when the population reached the maximum density which agriculture in the Hellenic homeland could support. Now the context. Historically, what we know as the Hellenic civilization uh, was the result of an uh, invasion uh, which uh, came from, minor, from Asia Minor. So people known today as Achaeans and Dorians invaded the Greek peninsula and uh, took over an already incumbent, more ancient civilization, the Minoan one. And at a certain, when they took over the Minoan civilization, they found themselves in a tight spot. By the way, similar to the tight spot that Germanic tribes face, uh, faced after the fall of the ancient Roman, uh, of the of the Western ancient Roman Empire, uh, which was simply the scarcity of food. Uh, when you destroy an established civilization with an established structure, you suddenly discover that you have uh, uh, more warriors than you, than, than you can feed and you need to find a food base. Huh? Uh, so Toyn uh, Toynbee de develops or developed, because it was in the past, uh, that uh, point of view, that uh, hypothesis, that cities were a solution hmm? and uh, that so that our urbanization is a solution to a recurrent challenge in human history. Uh, sharing fertile lowlands between many competing social groups. Now the broader theoretical context. If you look at the map of the world, you will find out that big cities have existed and still exist mostly in the lowlands. It is or in elevated plateaus, huh? but there are virtually no big cities in the mountains. In the mountains, you can find big conglomerations 
or big agglomerations of villages, but no cities. That's an important indicator. City is a social invention, is a social contrivance adapted especially to lowlands, to plains. And uh, uh, secondly, imagine that in a, in a lowland area, you have many competing social groups, like many tribes, many ethnic groups. They can constantly fight for the territory or they can create a more subtle structure. They can create cities and cities can be like those hubs of exchange. And then the rivalry between those competing social groups can be a rivalry for influence in and over the cities rather than straightforward war, rather than constant battle and combat. And I think that overall making cities and uh, rivaling for influence in those cities is more efficient uh, a way of being, of being socially, of being as a group, than uh, constant wars against other social groups. Cities are simply more efficient in terms of the use of available resources. And in the same time, this social contrivance, so the creation of cities, uh, has some limits. There are limits to the, uh, to the capacity of the system created with cities. And here comes another point of view from another like favorite author of mine, another favorite reading of mine. Uh, the reading is the book uh, by Fernand Brodel, the French historian. The book is entitled Civilization and Capitalism. And uh, Brodel puts forth an interesting thesis about cities, that cities are essentially demographic anomalies, like singularities. And once such a singularity emerges in a given place, it gives rise, first of all, to written culture and to the development of technology. Uh, and he puts it in that nice quote, I couldn't uh, resist putting in that slide. Towns are like electric transformers. They increase tension, accelerate the rhythm of exchange and constantly recharge human life. Interesting. Uh, I feel it very much like, like that, by the way. I am a city boy. I grew up in, a, in the city. I like the countryside, uh, but in like a cappuccino way, in moderate dosage. So my provisional conclusion, the conclusion that I sort of put an end to this particular update on my blog is that we, the human species, choose to be more and more crammed in cities because such a demographic anomaly allows us to transmute growing population into a growing diversity of skills. So if we were, hypothetically, if we had the demographic growth we have, and if we tried to live uh, in sort of a perfectly planned habitable space with small plots of land, medium, uh, medium sized houses in the middle of medium sized plots of land, every house or every household has a little bit of farming, a little, a little bit of food source with little industry, uh, just some roads. I heard a serious social scientist developing such a vision. The question is why there isn't any, why there isn't any such social structures in the world. So I think that as a species, we, we develop a collectively intelligent strategy to develop a growing diversity of skills in order to develop new technologies. And cities are a good way to developing the diversity of skills. Okay, that would be all in that video. So once again, a reminder, if you go into the description box below that video, you will find the link discoversocialsciences.com. You click on the link, it takes you to the website of my blog, Discover Social Sciences, and there you will find a written update who, uh, uh, which has the same title as the title of this video. 
So have fun with science. I hope you will have some pleasure with reading my writing. Bye. Until the next update.